The goal of biblical Christian education is not merely to fill a kid's head with facts, but to get his heart changed so that it's full of hope in God and not money and not esteem. And it doesn't care about the popularity at school or what the next kid on the bus is wearing. The aim is to change his heart and to root him in truth, which begets hope. So how do we help our children set their hope in God? John Piper turns to Psalm 78 for an answer to that question in this episode of Light and Truth. This sermon was originally preached at Bethlehem Baptist Church on June 8, 1986. I want to think with you this morning about this duty to train another generation of people to hope in God against the backdrop of this psalm, especially the first eight verses. Now, notice two things in this passage. Verse 5. First, God has spoken. He has revealed His will. He has given a testimony and a law. He has established a testimony in Jacob, it says, and appointed a law in Israel. Now we begin here because this is absolutely basic. If God hadn't spoken, if he hadn't revealed his will or interpreted his work, we would be absolutely adrift and rudderless in a sea of confusion here in the 20th century about the meaning of life. Everybody's got an idea about what is helpful and harmful about what is right and wrong and good and bad. But nobody knows, if you take eternity into view, what's really good for us and for our children. Everybody's got an idea, but those are only opinions that come from feeling what I'd like to do or cultural pressures, what's going to be acceptable to do, or tradition, what's always been done, or some other human authority. So-and-so said so, I heard on the radio. But without God's Word, who's going to know what's going to be good for me in a thousand years? And I don't really care what's good for me in 60 if it isn't good for me in a thousand If God hadn't spoken, we are left utterly adrift like a leaf in the middle of the ocean. That's the way most people talk today. They don't know. They've got an opinion. They state it as fact. A thousand people listen to them. A new school of thought is started. And then it passes away in a decade and we start all over again. If God hasn't spoken, there's no root. There's no foundation. So this verse says, number one, God has appointed a testimony. And when God sits in the witness dock, the whole world should listen and believe. So that's the first thing I see in this verse. God has appointed a testimony. And if you ask, what's the testimony? What did he say? Well, the answer is given in Exodus 31, 18, which says, God gave to Moses when he had made an end of speaking with him upon Mount Sinai two tables of the testimony. This is the same Hebrew word. Two tables of the testimony, tables of stone written with the finger of God. If you say, well, what's on those tables? You know what's on those tables. But it says in Exodus 34:28. God wrote upon the tables the words of the covenant, the Ten Commandments. Now we know what the testimony is, don't we? God has appointed a testimony, the tables of the testimony, the Ten Commandments. But take heed here very carefully. The Ten Commandments don't begin with commandments. You know how they begin, don't you? They begin like this. I am the Lord your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt and out of the house of bondage. The Ten Commandments don't begin with a thou shalt. They begin with an I have. 
The very first thing in the testimony of God on these tables is by my outstretched arm and my mighty hand, I have saved you, O Israel. I have made you my own. I have brought you to myself now because I am this kind of God. Behold how you should walk in relation to me. Don't have any other gods. And it all just flows out of the grace of God shown in the Exodus. So now we know the first thing that verse 5 says in Psalm 78. A testimony has been given. God has spoken. But in this testimony, there are really two things, not just one thing. There is a testimony to his work and his grace. And there is testimony to his law and what we should do in response to that grace. That's the first thing I see in verse 5. And the second thing I see in verse 5 is that we parents are commanded to teach this to our children. You see that in the second half of the verse. Which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children. You know what that means? That means that God does not intend to speak to the world in every generation the way he spoke to Moses. Or the way he spoke to the apostles. There are seasons of redemptive history in which God comes dramatically into history. He authorizes prophets and apostles to deliver a once for all faith. He closes it up in a book and he says, fathers, now it's your job. You teach it to your children And their blood will be upon your hands if you neglect to deliver to them the faith once for all delivered to the saints by his holy apostles and prophets revealed in his inspired word. So the second thing we see in this verse is that not only has there been delivered a wonderful word to guide creatures of God. But there has been given a command, fathers, it is your duty to teach it to your children. Well, that's verse five. That's the work of God to deliver a word and command us as parents to teach it to our children. The second section of our text is verses one to four, Asaph's act. Well, what is Asaph's act? Asaph obeyed verse 5 and declared the word and work of God to a new generation. Let's read it. Verse 1, give ear, O my people, to my teaching. Incline your ears to the words of my mouth. I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings from of old. Things that we have heard and known that our fathers have told us. We will not hide them from our children But tell them to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord and his might and the wonders which he has wrought. Now, notice two things jump off the page to me from these verses. One is that as Asaph does what God has instructed him to do, he doesn't focus first on the commandments of God. He focuses first on the work of God. Look at verse four there. You see that tell to the coming generation the glorious deeds of the Lord, his might, his wonders, which he has wrought. Now, that's why I said back in verse five, it's very important to know that the testimony which God has established is a testimony of his work as well as his word. The Ten Commandments begin. I am the Lord, your God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt. You tell your children about Frogs and grasshoppers and hail and darkness and red water and split seas and falling bread and quails and lightning and thunder and shirts that don't wear out. You tell them the great work of God in history so that when you tell them, thou shalt not lie. They know who's talking. They know what sort of God has called them to honor their parents and keep themselves sexually pure 
Not be covetous towards the world. They know with whom they have to do because you've told them the stories of Scripture and they've seen God at work in the world. That's what's up here in verses 1 to 4. Asaph is doing what he has been told to do. That's the first thing. The second thing I see in these verses really puzzles me. Verse 2. Why does he call this psalm a parable? I will open my mouth in a parable. I will utter dark sayings or riddles, puzzles from of old. Now, the reason that stands out and begs for an explanation is because Psalm 78 doesn't look like a parable. It's history. You read it, it's just a story of God's Dealings with this rebellious people, Israel, from the time of the Exodus to the time of David. And so I worked and worked thinking, why does he call this psalm a parable and a riddle? Could it be that Asaph calls this a riddle or a parable because he leaves us with a puzzle or a riddle in this psalm with a question in our minds about two of the greatest Puzzles in Israel's history. First, he raises this riddle. Why? 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 Why is Israel so recalcitrant and rebellious? Look at verse 40. It describes the rebellion and and look at how frequent it is. This is how often, underline that word often, how often they rebelled against him in the wilderness, grieved him in the desert. They tested him again and again and provoked the Holy One of Israel. Why? Why didn't they believe and obey? Why is man like that? He doesn't answer the question. He just leaves it for us to think about. He draws us in. And then the second riddle is, why is God so patient with this people? Why is he so long suffering? I mean, after they do all that grumbling again and again, after all that mercy again and again, why not just end it? Look at verse 38. It describes this strange and inexplicable grace. Yet he, being compassionate, forgave their iniquity did not destroy them. He restrained his anger often. Underline that. Oh, that's such a wonderful verse. A wonderful word. Often. He restrained his anger often and did not stir up all his wrath. Even when he got mad, he didn't get totally mad at this people. Well, here's this psalm that's calling itself a parable, leaving us stunned with two riddles. Why is man like that? And why is God like that? And just like the parables of Jesus, if you look at it long enough, it does something to you. You wind up not any longer saying, why are they like that? Why am I like that? That's me. That's me. I've wrestled with this sin years and years and I don't know why. And and maybe this God will not throw me away either. I think that's the effect of a parable in, in Jesus' language. It draws you in. It forces you to ask questions. It leaves you with riddles that it intends for you to answer before God with you as the center subject. So... Asaph's act, what is it in verses 1 to 4? It's obedience to the command to make known the testimony of God. He does it in a matchless way. He tells a story about the the, the wickedness, the incredible rebelliousness and stubbornness of his people and the incredible grace of God. And we'll come back to that to see why. Why he did it just like that. But let's go finally to God's aim in verses 6 to 8. What is God's aim in commanding that we teach the next generation the testimony of the law? Let's read verses 6 to 8. That the next generation might know them, 
the children yet unborn and arise and tell them to their children so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments and that they should not be like their fathers, a stubborn and rebellious generation, a generation whose heart was not steadfast and whose spirit was not faithful to God. Now, three aims of education come out of this set of verses. First, the aim of education is to impart knowledge. Verse 6, that the next generation might know. Now, probably you would agree with me that love for God is superior and more important than knowledge of God. Because the devils have a very extensive knowledge of God and they tremble and it does them no good. But what a tragedy when seeing that priority, we draw the wrong conclusion and say, well, I'm not going to mix up get mixed up with all this knowing and all this learning, knowledge puffs up, so I'm going to do an in run and a detour around that and just try to get my children to love God. And the reason I say it's a tragedy is because it can't be done. Because what happens over here, if you leave out truth and doctrine and learning and knowledge, is mere emotionalism. What the old Saints used to call fanaticism or enthusiasm. It has no root. It has no foundation. You can't do it. And therefore, this text is very crucial in its first point. Namely, the first aim of education is that they might know. Second, the aim of education is that children would put their hope in God. Verse 6 goes on to say that the next generation might know them, the children yet unborn, and arise and tell them to their children so that they should set their hope in God. Knowledge should lead to hope. What goes into the head should change the heart. And if one set of people err over here by saying knowledge is dangerous, Knowledge isn't necessary. We will do an end run around it and just beget emotion or feeling or hope or love. Somebody else errs on the other side by saying it is the role of education to get facts, nothing but the facts into kids' heads. It's not our job to change their hearts. You can't be a biblical educator with that attitude. The goal of biblical Christian education is not merely to fill a kid's head with facts, but to get his heart changed so that it's full of hope in God and not money and not esteem. And it doesn't care about the popularity at school or what the next kid on the bus is wearing. The aim is to change his heart and to root him in truth, which begets hope. And the third aim of education in these verses is stated in verse 7 so that they should set their hope in God and not forget his works, the works of God, but keep his commandments. Education has to do not just with facts that you get into a child's head, feelings that you get into a child's heart, but acts that you get into his life. The aim of education is knowledge of God, hope in God, obedience to God. And there are so many people today who believe that all God cares about is the first two. If you have enough warm feelings about God, it doesn't matter if you disobey. I get so frustrated in my pastoral counseling with people that tell me how warm they are towards God, how sweet God has become to their lives while they plan to disobey. It is rampant. We live in an incredibly emotionally driven age where cultural pressures and traditions and gut feelings drive our lives and so few people live by principle whether it hurts for 30 years or not. 
Let's not be that way. Let's be different from the world. Let's live by principle. By the word of God. In summary, verse 5 says God's act is that he established a testimony in Jacob. He revealed his word and he commanded us to teach it. Secondly, Asaph's act was to obey that word and to declare man's sin and God's grace. Now, I said I would come back to this because I want you to see a connection here. Many people say knowledge puffs up and it does if it's not communicated in the right way. That's why they want to do end runs around knowledge. But watch Asaph at work imparting knowledge. How does he do it? He just placards the sin of man with the ugliest colors he can. This is a psalm that is utterly depressing about human nature. And the effect of it is to humble me when I read it. Yeah, that's the way I am. I rebel again and again and again. Crush. And then, alongside that message, here comes the most vivid Yellow, green, orange, blue, and purple display of the grace of God imaginable. And against the black backdrop of my sin, it shines. And out of my crushed spirit, there rises hope. You see then why he says the aim of education is hope. And then what he does, sin and grace create humility and hope. That's the way to educate our children. Teach them that they have original sin, that they are sinful to the core, that there's only one hope for them, Christ. And oh, what a hope He is. All they will ever need to gain eternal life and live in joy forever and ever and to make strides in sanctification here. This is Light and Truth. God-centered preaching to help you see Christ clearly and treasure Him truly. I'm your host, Dan Kruver. Thank you for listening. On our next episode, John Piper continues our 12-part series on hope with a sermon titled, Rejoicing in Our Hope. I hope you'll join us. For more resources, visit DesiringGod.org.